Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello out there in YouTube land. Uh, it's very exciting to be with you. My name is Steve Cross. I am holding together this science showcase today. And I should let you know that this science showcase is probably going to be the most informative way that you've spent a lunchtime in a very, very long time. Now, you might think that I'm just waffling a little bit, but it's because there's a slight delay. So I had to make sure that the YouTube actually worked. Um, so what you're going to see during the next hour is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the most incredible engineering brains that London, nay, the world, has to offer, all of whom are looking at ideas around healthcare. How can we take engineering, this kind of process, this way of thinking, this way of kind of structuring the world and creating new things and apply it to us, apply it to people. Um, so these aren't the engineers who build buildings. These aren't the engineers who build giant cables under the sea. These are the engineers who build things that help make you and me live our lives better. Uh, today's event is put together by the UCL Institute of Healthcare Engineering. You can see their logo. Wait, wait, wait. No, point right, Steve. There. It's very hard doing this with mirrored video. And uh, their Twitter is here. And throughout today's event, if you've got any questions for any of the speakers, if you've got anything you'd like to say to us, uh, use Twitter, use at health underscore eng, um, and then you'll be able to, to chat to us. Uh, in the background is the Institute's incredible communications manager, Alice Hardy. Uh, Alice is watching the Twitter, I'm watching the Twitter, and if we can't get you answers during the event, we'll get you answers from our speakers eventually. But enough, I mean, I know what you're saying, enough of just a random middle-aged dad in his shed. Uh, we actually want to hear genius healthcare engineers. So that is what I'm going to deliver for you. And the thing is, I know wherever you are, you're watching this on your phone, you're watching this on your computer, you might even be watching this on your telly. And um, you don't feel like you're at an event, but you are at an event. So what we're going to do is, whenever I introduce a speaker, I'm going to bring them onto the screen with me and say hello, and then I'll introduce them formally and I'll get off the screen. And when I introduce them formally, I'd just like you to clap. Just like, great work with the healthcare engineering. And then again, when they finish their set, I want you to clap again. And even if you're on your own, clap. It'll make you enjoy the whole thing much more. Weirdly, studies have shown a phrase that people like me, science communicators, use to cover up the fact we haven't actually checked whether studies show anything. Uh, studies have shown that you take in information more when you clap before a speaker speaks on YouTube. Um, so I'm going to pop our very first speaker up onto the stream. Hello. Hello, Oriol. Um, Oriol, uh, partly I bring you up onto the screen. There, good, to remind you to unmute your microphone. So Hello. lovely people out there on YouTube, would you please, wherever you are, give a massive round of applause and welcome to the screen and into your house and into your heart, the wonderful Oriol. Thank you very much. Um, well, hello, I'm Oriol. And I'm here to talk to you about X-ray imaging. But everyone hates X-rays, so let's start with something a little different. Let's talk about the sea. I'm from Barcelona in Spain. And as a kid in the summer, I used to go to the beach. And while my family was sunbathing, I'd go to the harbor, to this strip of concrete, which was used to lower boats into the water. Right where the water and the concrete met, there would be little tiny seashells with the live animals still inside roaming around in the algae. And I used to pick them up and talk to them and give them names and then throw them back into the water in the hopes that they tell their other seashell friends about me. Now, I feel like I can hear you yelling in your head, what does this have to do with x-rays? Well, let me tell you, I remember being struck by how when I put my hand under the water in order to catch the shells, it was distorted, almost like my eye was telling me that my hand was in one spot, but it was actually slightly to the right or to the left. Like if I tried to look too hard, I'd get a headache. Well, all of that is caused by something called refraction. Refraction is the phenomenon by which the direction of light, such as the rays of sun, is changed while it passes through an object, such as water. Now, swap rays of sun by x-rays, and water by, for example, breast tissue, and you've got an idea of what I do. I use the refraction of x-rays to get nice images of samples, such as tumoral tissue. I do this by a method developed here at UCL, which consists in splitting the x-ray beam into several smaller beams, hundreds of them. 
Think of this as the way the shutters in a window can split the light coming in from the street into these long, separated arrays of light. Each of these individual beamlets will change direction slightly when hitting a sample, and we can track the change in direction of each of these individual beams in order to track the refraction and get a load of information about our sample. My work is on the development side of refraction imaging. I work very hard behind the scenes, trying to make sure that X-ray refraction imaging works as smoothly and efficiently as possible. In fact, I rarely get to work on using the science myself for specific applications. Rather, I'm in the background trying to make sure that the physics behind that science works. However, recently, I was lucky enough to participate in a project using this method of imaging to improve the examination of breast tissue during the removal of breast tumors in order to make sure that the whole tumor has been taken out. This is very interesting because reoperations are actually fairly common when removing breast tumors in cases where the tumor just hasn't been fully taken out. And, and then that means that the person, the patient, needs to go into surgery again to make sure that the tumor is removed, which, as you can imagine, is a real pain for patients. So improving our visualization of the tumors could mean a massive improvement to the well-being of patients and even a reduction of costs to the NHS. The fantastic thing about our method is, in fact, precisely that we are able to see soft tissue, biological tissue, such as breast tissue, much better than with normal x-rays. Usually, when you get an x-ray, for example, a mammography, the x-rays go through your body and different parts of your tissue absorb more or fewer x-rays. They keep some of those x-rays to themselves. And that's how you can see what's going on inside. However, this is not always enough to get a clear image of what's going on because tissues like tumors and normal breast tissue have very similar absorption. Refraction, however, this phenomenon that we are all familiar with that I used to experience all the time as a solitary, curious kid at the beach in Barcelona. This simple fact of life that most of us don't even think twice about, refraction, can massively improve the science of x-rays. Materials with similar absorption often produce very different refraction. So we can use it to get beautiful, detailed images of things that we could never see before. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you. Amazing, Oriel. I mean, as you can see, I'm a very big fan of uh, refraction myself. Mm -hmm. It's incredible to think that we can use it in that sort of way. Um, so uh, if you would like to praise any of our speakers, remember, you can always comment on YouTube and then I can bring the praise over to show them. Let's see, we uh, no one's praising you on YouTube yet, Oriel, but I'm sure they're praising you right. down, down in their hearts. Thank you so much for taking Thank us you. into the world, the new world of x-rays. We all think we understand x-rays, but it turns out x-rays have got a whole bunch of tricks that none of us anticipated. Wonderful. Now, I am going to lead us by the hand over to our next speaker. Uh, the slight pause is me checking that their camera's on. Um, I'll bring them up onto the screen. Hello, Natwan. How's your how's your day going so far? Hi, I've been doing very good. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. So you're you're ready to help everybody see inside the world of your wonderful new research. So remember, friends, wherever you are, when I introduce Natwan, I need you to applaud. And uh, if you could do it so loudly that people in other rooms uh, look at you oddly, or if you're at your desk people from across the office are like, what's going on over there? Then um, that's part of the whole joy. So please welcome into your screens and into your hearts, my good friend, Natwan. Hi everyone, my name is Natwan. I am an honorary senior fellow at UCL Ear Institute. I am also an ear doctor taking care of older adults with hearing and speech processing problems. Did you know that if you have hearing loss, you are more at risk of developing dementia than your friends sitting next to you by nearly two folds. Hearing loss is the highest risk factor for brain shrinkage that is treatable. When the brain does not hear well, it has less stimulation and soon will deteriorate. I am researching the best way to help older adults and your loved ones to live longer and healthier lives. Hearing loss is extremely common. 
at the age of 65, one in three people is suffering from a hearing problem. This number increased to one in two when you are at age 75. In the clinic, we mostly see older adults with disabilities who refuse to get the support they need, especially with hearing treatment. They said everyone else was mumbling, so they could not hear, but they were fine. They turned up the TV volume so loudly, but said they were fine. Hearing aids are viewed as a burden and too complicated for this population. Little did they know that this hearing intervention can decrease their risk of developing dementia. Our research helps early detect hearing problems and treat them before it causes brain damage. The main goal is early detection. It's actually challenging to know when you start to lose your hearing. This is because your hearing gradually worsened and you're used to it bit by bit, so you would not notice the thing. Designing the best program to screen for this condition is usually just the beginning of the story. These older adults usually also have memory and brain deterioration, making hearing screening even more challenging. We've been researching existing databases to determine the best hearing screening method for detecting hearing problems in people with dementia. In addition, we did a patient's public involvement and engagement activity. We had a stall up and a poster up with 250 older adults in the hospital who joined on World Hearing Day in March. We aimed to explore more about people's opinions of the screening method. We made a mobile application that can detect hearing loss, which in turn can help early detection of dementia. Early detection equal better outcomes for people. We sparked the idea of this application from our previous Facebook Live event with the older adults. We understood more that older adults may not always be familiar with mobile application and technology. We observed how they interact with the application, especially the one who tried to run away when they saw the application. We ran after them since we know that their feedbacks are even more valuable. We adopt the user interface and we adapt the user interface to create a better user experience for them. We will start to implement this hearing screening protocol in a real clinical setting and should be able to pick up many people suffering from hearing and dementia problems. Afterward, we will interview the patients and their carers to understand them more we want to know what type of hearing intervention program would suit their daily life pattern. This step is crucial to involve the family and the patient's feedback to create the best intervention they want to stick to. With this insight, we can help you and your loved ones live longer and healthier lives. Thank you. Marvelous work, that's one. Um... There's some statistics in there that I found absolutely frightening as somebody who has absolutely damaged their hearing over the years through far too much noisy music and things. Um, uh, do you recommend that, that we all go and get hearing tests? Actually, the WHO recommend that if your age over 50, all of you should get your hearing screening. So people would normally think, oh, 50, I'm not that old. But, you know, at the age of 50, your hearing start to, like, you know, get worse bit by bit. And yeah. as I mentioned earlier, you may not notice it as well. No, of course. I've always thought that everybody else needs to speak more clearly. Um, thank you so much, Natan. That was an absolutely wonderful, wonderful talk. Now, uh, I'm going to bring up our next incredible engineer. So far, we've, uh, we've looked deep inside the body. We've looked deep inside the brain. Let's find out where we're going to go next with Shoba. Hello there, Shoba. I'm just giving you a moment to unmute your microphone. Sorry. Hi. There we Hi, go. Steve. Perfect. No, <laughs> it's all going marvelously. This is why we do this little uh, together, little intro section. So, um, wonderful viewers, and uh, it's quite a lot of you out there. Uh, please, um, could you give a big round of applause wherever you are to the wonderful Shoba? 
Thank you. Hi, everyone. So my name's Shoba, and I'm a GP and a researcher at the UCL eHealth unit. Doing both of these things means that at my GP surgery, I can see firsthand the challenges that my patients are facing and then come back to UCL and come up with ideas for research that will help. I'm a proud East Londoner and the diversity of my neighbourhood inspires a lot of the work that I do. And I'm also mum to a toddler, so I'm quite looking forward to being able to talk for a few minutes uninterrupted without being asked, but why mummy? Unlike some of my colleagues, I'm not an engineer, but I do work with software engineers to develop websites and apps that help support people with their health. This is known as digital health research and also involves exploring how people access health services using the internet, which has become more and more common since the COVID pandemic. If you've tried to book a GP appointment recently, you'll have been encouraged to book online. Even getting a COVID pass before you travel means using the NHS app, but that isn't easy for everyone. And some people can't or don't want to get help with their health online. I want to tell you a story about how difficult it can be for some people to access help online. Daisy is a 75 year old lady. She lives alone in temporary accommodation and spent her last birthday in hospital. She has multiple health problems and requires regular visits to her GP and local hospital. She has, she relies on her state pension and believes that broadband internet would be too expensive. She also says, I haven't got a computer. I have a traditional old fashioned phone and my landline. That's my only form of communication. But she would like to video call her family and to have more interaction with people in her local area. It's people like Daisy who interest me and inspire the work that I do. So far, my research has focused on developing and testing apps and websites, like a website for people living with type 2 diabetes, which is now available nationally via the NHS. This research involved working with a team of doctors, nurses, computer scientists and members of the public to work out what needed to go into the website, creating test versions and asking people what they think. We use techniques borrowed from something called human computer interaction or the study of how humans interact with computers. There are lots of challenges to doing this kind of research, including how to encourage and support people to start using a website and to continue using it enough that it can improve their health. One of the things that I notice is that some groups find apps and websites harder to use or are less interested in using them and aren't involved in the research and design process as much as they should be. So now I'm working on exploring these issues further and tackling something known as digital exclusion. Put simply, digital exclusion means either not having access to the internet, not having the skills to access the internet, or not being interested in using the internet. We use the word exclusion when we talk about the internet because it relates to a sense of being left out. And you only need to think back to the story about Daisy to see how digital exclusion can make you feel left out. And it's not just Daisy and older people who can be digitally excluded. Data also suggests that people with less income, less education, people in rural areas and people with disabilities are also at high risk of digital exclusion. So what can research do to help? First of all, we need to better understand how and why people use the internet, because the information that we have at the moment doesn't paint the whole picture. Even among those people who do go online, people's access to opportunities varies. For example, some people who use the internet only use it for social media or entertainment. That's why I'm working on collecting more information, particularly from Daisy and people like her, about if, how and why they use the internet. I'm also interested in what we're doing to help people with less digital skills. There are digital skills training programmes out there and you may have seen them yourself in your local libraries, but we don't yet know how and if they work and if by improving someone's digital skills we can also improve their health. So I'm hoping to be able to connect the dots between digital exclusion and people's health experiences. I mean, by doing this, I hope to be able to help people who are most vulnerable to having poor health. Thinking back to Daisy, how can we make it easier for her to connect to the internet, to talk to her family and to meet up with her local community to do activities which improve her health? These are challenges that are easily ignored, but can make big differences to the lives of people who are struggling the most. Thank you. Incredible stuff, incredible stuff. Um, Shoba's muted, so I'll. Uh, uh, I just wanted to say, Shoba. Um, I mean, it's incredible work. I'm I'm very internetty, but I yeah. still spend a lot of time swearing and screaming, uh, trying to access <laughs> me NHS too. services. Yeah, uh, me too. Yeah, I, I think yeah. that says so much because if we, as people who kind of work in this field, find it difficult, then imagine how oh, hard it is for people who don't. Oh, it must be terrible, terrible. 
you know, I'm so glad you're working in this field. Um, it'll mean fewer phone calls from parents saying, how do I get the, if only it's made more easy. Thank you so much, Shoba. Um, so now that we've heard, uh, we've gone, what have we done? We've gone inside the body, we've gone inside the mind, we've looked at whole systems and how we interact with them. This is lovely and varied. Uh, I'm going to bring up our next wonderful speaker. So uh, our next incredible speaker is uh, Azadeh, um, who I think is dialing in from work rather than her home. She doesn't have absolutely amazing kit in a living room. She might. I mean, is that, Azadeh, is that a robot arm behind you? Yes, yes, it's an industrial robot arm. <laughs> yeah, in our lab at UCL. Yeah. So you can just, you just build a car whenever you've got a bit of free time. <laughs> uh, maybe <laughs> I think I've thrown her off you uh, I'm gonna go away so um lovely people wherever you are would you please give a huge round of applause for Azadeh uh, thank you Steve uh, hi my name is Azadeh Shariati I'm a roboticist and a postdoctoral research fellow in haptics and soft robotics at UCL haptics means uh, the sense of touch and soft robotics means using soft material in robots. When I was 18 and I wanted to enter the university, my ambition was to be a physician. But at that, that time, I used to be afraid of seeing blood. So as I also was interested in maths, I selected engineering and my life easily changed. I focused on robotics, but all through my study, I always deal with industrial robots and pure math and pure physics. And I always told myself physicians are very lucky because they can do something very effective for people right away. But for me, it takes longer to see the positive effect of my job on people's life. At that time, I understood that robots can be influential in another way. They can be used for interacting with people, education, and also for rehabilitation, uh, which is named social and assistive robotics. I worked in this field after completing my PhD. We made some ro robots for education and rehabilitation of children with autism, children with cancer, and also we made a robotic hand to teach sign language to children who were hearing impaired. I was really happy, really satisfied to see how children were involved with robots. I saw a child with cancer who was in isolation and depression for several months and just accepted to come out from his room to see the robot telling him a story. It was amazing. It was, it was fascinating to see how hearing impaired children love the robot and were engaged to uh, imitate it when doing sign language. But at the same time, kids shouldn't touch the robot. The robot couldn't have physical interaction with them. And me and all the team members were very worried about the safety because our robot was made of hard parts and it might harm kids. On the other hand, it was so expensive and complicated with different electronics and mechanical parts. So if it failed to work, we couldn't rebuild another one in a short time. This problem should be solved. You know, most living creatures are a combination of soft and hard parts. For decades, our perception of a robot was an industrial or human-shaped robot with hard parts. Thinking about nature, we understood soft we understood soft material can be used in robots, which called soft robotics. When a robot or instrument is made of soft material, it will be safer and people could have more physical interaction with it. They can touch it, even cuddle it, and use it for other applications like non-invasive surgical tools, as you can see in the video. Currently, here uh, at UCL, I'm developing a robotic finger using soft robotic components. This finger can be used for amputees. It's body powered and doesn't need any electronic or motors. An interesting capability of the finger is it is soft at the fingertip, so other people can shake hands easily. And also, it has a sense of touch, which gives the amputee more opportunity to interact with people and with the environment. Current move, uh, movable prosthetic fingers 
uh, and hands are super expensive and complicated and are not accessible to everyone. The processes that we are developing will be affordable to people and national health system around the globe. Soft robotics are not limited to the familiar shapes that we see in the nature or traditional shapes, traditional robotic shapes. Here again, you can see an artistic structure that we recently made and has soft parts which uh, could interact with people and it reflect the experience of a group of people during uh, COVID-19 lockdown. So welcome to the world of soft interactive robots. And thank you very much. That was absolutely wonderful. I'm really intrigued by the idea of uh, that children uh, really want to interact with robots. I, I have very young children and um, they'd rather interact with a robot than me. They'd rather interact with a pebble than me. Um, <laughs> Anything is more interesting than I am. Um, that was that was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much, Azada. No worries. Send you back down to there. Now I've got to get the name of the next. Oh, it's Uzair. Let's, let's bring Uzair across the screen. Uzair, hello. How's your uh, how's your day going so far? Are you feeling ready for this? Yeah, good. Thanks. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So um, wonderful viewers out there in YouTube land. Um, please welcome onto your screens and remember, we're going to applaud the marvellous Uzair. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Steve. So uh, I'm Uzair and just very briefly about myself. I'm a diehard native Londoner, uh, a keen climber and just generally an all round outdoor enthusiast. And in my spare time, I'm a researcher who works at the intersection between engineering and neuroscience. So more specifically, I'm trying to figure out how we can improve our understanding of what goes on in our brains and our bodies when we're engaged in interactions. So what do I actually mean by an interaction? Well, it can mean anything involving two or more people, having a conversation, playing football, or just looking at someone's face. So if we think about the simplest form of interaction, which is just looking at someone's face, there's still a whole bunch of things which are going on. So you focus on specific parts of a person's face and each part is processed in a different place in your brain to get some meaning about what's actually happening in this interaction. So for some people, looking at this face might make them feel more awkward or nervous uh, and for others you might feel more comforted or more at ease. So these distinctions in how we feel are really present in all types of interaction and they're incredibly important when we think about neurodivergent conditions. So pretty much all neurodivergences have some kind of social difference component involved. So the standard example that uh, people use is autism, which is typically characterized by a different way of social communication compared to neurotypical people. But in fact, pretty much all neurodivergences have some kind of social communication component involved in them, um, which can vary in the severity or how they manifest and where in the brain they're most directly manifesting. So the big overarching goal of what we do is to be able to first detect these differences, um, then find out why exactly they exist, and then how and where they manifest. And at some point, probably in the far future, uh, we might have a better way of detecting these neurodivergences at a, a much earlier stage than we can now, which can help us to understand how we can better communicate and facilitate people who have them. So how do we actually detect these differences? So we use a whole bunch of equipment, including uh, heart and breathing rate monitors, uh, eye trackers, uh, sweaty palm monitors. And then we have cameras, which record people's faces and the environments they're in and so on and so on. But the cherry on top of this whole setup is that we use lasers to scan their brains. Uh, so it's pretty new technology and it sounds quite sci-fi, but the underlying principle is actually really easy to understand. So if you take your phone and turn your light on, what you see coming out is white light and it has every color that we can see contained within it. So if you put your finger over the light, what you can see is just red. Why? Because red is able to travel pretty, pretty easily through tissue, whereas the other colors are absorbed by the tissue. Um, so red can travel right through it. So if you look closer at your finger or move it down to like here and then look closer, you can kind of see these black lines and these are your blood vessels. So they are black because the red is actually absorbed quite heavily by the blood inside your vessels so when we look at the brain if an area of the brain is active it gets a whole load of blood flooded to it so that it can do what it needs to do so when we look so by looking for areas where the light is absorbed really heavily 
we can say that that part of the brain is active. And we do all of this while people are sitting at a table or walking around and you know talking to people or playing a game or whatever. So we scan them both at the same time, which allows us to see what's happening in both brains and their bodies as these interactions unfold. So once we've got all of this data, how do we actually do something useful with it? Uh, to be honest, we don't actually know yet. So this type of neuroscience is quite, quite new. It's about 20 years, maybe less than. And ways of combining all of this data in useful ways are still not really well understood or developed. So the most common way that we do it is uh, we look at the similarity between brain signals. So we, uh, during an interaction, we look at like, for example, this part of my brain and the same part in the other person's brain and say, okay, there's some similarity that exists between that area during this specific part of the experiment, like when they make eye contact or when they're talking or when they're like focused on a specific task together. But what that similarity actually means uh, from a neuroscience perspective is not very well understood. So one way we can try and make sense of all of this interaction and this data a bit more holistically rather than just looking at similarity is we can look at the brain of one person and see what part of their brain is causing an effect in their body, so changing their heart or breathing rate, and then how is that causing an effect on their behavior? And then does that change in behavior cause a change in the other person's behavior, which causes a change in their body and then in their brain? Uh, so yeah, thank you all for listening. And just to really quickly conclude, this is a very, very new and exciting area of research. And if we get it right, we can get a better understanding of how we've evolved to be social for one. So, you know, from a human understanding, human evolution perspective, but the more important uh, reason, from my perspective at least, is that we have a, a real chance to make a huge difference to people who do have neurodivergences and anyone who might know someone with a neurodivergence. So yeah, thanks for listening. Um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the day, I guess. <laughs> it's a lovely ending. Enjoy the rest of the day, I guess. Um, thank you so much, Uzair. Um the, the sorry the first comment that's appeared in our secret green room chat is so chilled uh that was an absolutely marvelous a, lo a lovely little wander through the different ways that neuroscience is starting to understand us thank you so much for that um i'm going to bring our next uh incredible speaker onto your screens um hello hi steve is your, is your day going well are you enjoying the talks so far yeah no amazing it's always great to hear about all the science and stuff so definitely enjoying it Okay, perfect, perfect, good. Well, I'm going to get out of your way. Uh, I'm going to let you entertain the lovely people that we have over on YouTube and uh, the people who'll be watching this in the future in all sorts of different ways. So wherever you are, would you please give a big round of applause and welcome onto your screens, Nor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Noor. I'm a pharmacist and a PhD researcher at UCL School of Pharmacy. And I'll be talking to you today about my research in gene therapy. So while talking about gene therapy might sound fancy and more like a science fiction story, but diseases with genetic origin are actually very common and they have drastic effect on patients' lives. So one example that could come to mind is Angelina Julie, who actually had to go through a mastectomy surgery to remove all her breast tissues because she had a genetic mutation that put her at high risk of developing breast cancer. Another example that you could be all familiar with is Stephen Hawking, the physicist who had ALS, a disease that has no cure and made him lose all his body function. And these are only two out of millions of people around the world who are struggling with incurable diseases. But with the advances of gene therapy that we have now, we actually hope that we can treat and probably cure many of these diseases. But before I tell you how, just let me tell you a little bit about how our genes works. So our genes are our building blocks. They determine everything about us from the way we look to how every organ in our body functions. And actually you can think about our genes as a set of instructions that we have. And these instructions are carried by a messenger molecules called messenger RNA that our cells read and use to uh, follow to make um, the proteins that they need to actually function. And this whole process is controlled by molecules that we call small interfering molecules. Um, and these actually can break down the messenger molecule once we don't need it anymore in the cells. And this is how things normally work. But in some cases, sometimes people are born with defects in their genes, or they can over time develop problems with the instructions they carry with their messenger. 
And when we have this issue, this means that the proteins that are being formed are actually harmful and may cause many diseases like cancer or ALS. Um, and this is where my research lies. So, you know, these small um, interfering molecules that I mentioned, we can actually use these and design them to specifically destroy the harmful um, RNA, uh, the harmful messenger, and we basically can stop all these harmful proteins from forming. And this is great because if we can do this, we can actually target the origin of the disease and stop it before we treat the symptoms. And this can opens up the opportunity to treat many diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's that currently have no treatment. So, but actually, while this is also exciting and amazing and promising, to deliver these interfering molecules to the cells is actually not an easy mission. So you see, our bodies are very smart and are designed to protect us. So if we would take these interfering molecules and inject them directly to the blood, our body will attack and destroy them, thinking they are a viral infection. So in my work, I focus on using materials from natural sources um, that can actually protect these um, interfering molecules and deliver them to the cells where we want. Specifically, I am using amino acids, and these are natural compounds that we consume in our food and our body actually use to make proteins and join other functions in the body. So what I do, we actually discovered that these amino acids can actually make have properties that make materials that can easily envelop these interfering molecules and form very, very, very tiny particles that we call nanoparticles. Once we give these nanoparticles, inject them into the blood, they can actually escape the attacks of the body, recognize the cells we want, get into them, and release our interfering molecules that can attack, um, as I said, the faulty messenger and to break the harmful proteins. Once these nanoparticles done their job, because they are from natural materials, we can they can easily break down and release outside the body with no toxic effects on patients. And briefly, this is in a nutshell what I wanted to say about how we are trying to make um, gene therapies that are actually safe, efficient, and hopefully accessible to all patients. So um, watch this space and thanks for listening. I just realized I clapped with a muted microphone, so I'll clap again properly. Um, no, that was absolutely one. I'm, I'm really enjoying today just the differences in scale that people are working at. And it's all kind of wrapped up in healthcare engineering, but you're right down at engineering individual molecules. It's incredible stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you the, the terrible question people always ask people who have research like this. So uh, when, are, when are we going to see it in clinics? Uh, actually, well, my research still like needs time, but actually this molecule that I'm working on has actually made it. So there is um, actually oh, wow. a drug currently in the NHS that is marketed, but we still like need to work on improving it. And this is where research comes. You you have like a drug that works for something, but you want also to apply it for other things and make it safer and always better. So it is there in the market. There is like Stunning. one product in the NHS, but hopefully we can make more. That's wonderful. So applied already. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Noor. Um, I'm going to bring up our final speaker now um, and don't run away straight after our final speaker we've got a few things that we need to do together uh, after our final speaker has spoken um, here's our final speaker dialing in from an extremely luxurious residence um, <laughs> well, it looks it looks lovely from here that's all I can say Thank you. so wherever you wherever you are viewers uh, whenever you are viewers because many of you will be watching this back on a replay later maybe for centuries into the future uh, would you please uh, give a big round of applause and uh, welcome onto your screens, Hend. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, hi everybody. My name is Hend. Uh, I'm an associate lecturer at UCL School of Pharmacy. So, me and Nor work in the same place and I'm a pharmacist by background. So, I'm very interested in the taste of medicines and how that affects people's ability to be consistent and continue to take their pills in the long run. So, it could be okay if you take an odd pill for a headache, you know, you'll just get on with it, but it could be really problematic in the long run uh, for long-term diseases. So listening to all those amazing technologies, so if a medicine is super cool, it's got this amazing nanotechnology and it works wonders, but the patient won't take it. It's not going to be amazing anymore because the patient won't take it. So I'm sure if we all think back to our childhood and even now, there's a number of medicines that you'd hate to take and you'd rather just have, you know, lemon and honey. But with more serious diseases, 
it becomes an issue. And really, when you think of taste, it can mean a lot of different things. It can mean sweet, sour, salty, bitter, or even umami, which is the meaty taste. And these are the basic five taste qualities. But in the pharmaceutical industry, we are mostly interested in working on improving bitterness, as that's the one that seems to be causing the most problems. The rest are fine. Actually, there's some studies that show that children prefer sour medicines, so it doesn't seem to be a problem. But that doesn't always adding mean adding a spoonful of sugar when you try to improve the taste. Although that is the case with, you know, a lot of the medicines and things like Calpol that most of us probably love. But there are smarter ways to improve the taste of medicines, and it doesn't just involve adding sugar. So something like including uh, wrapping the medicine in an envelope of material, like film coating it's called, and um, that, that makes it protected in the mouth and it doesn't get released. So when the person takes the medicine, they can't feel the taste of it, happy days. But but um, before we can identify how to improve the taste of a medicine, we need to really figure out how big of a problem is it. We need to quantify it. So what I do in my research is measure how badly tasting a medicine is. So the best way to do this is to get a group of people and ask them to identify the way they feel about the taste and rank it from 1 to 10, for example, which is similar to the jelly bean taste experiment, if you've ever gone through one, and you sort of match the flavors, give it a ranking, which is higher, which is strawberry, that sort of thing. And um, people do that as well with coffee, like which is low roast, which is medium roast, which is high roast. So this is very good with food, really, and with well-established medicines. So. The best way to determine the taste really is to ask people to measure it, but it can be expensive, it can be time consuming and requires a lot of paperwork, especially ethical approval, safety approval. And as I said, that's okay for established medicines, but if you've got a brand new drug with little safety information, with little use in humans, it becomes more difficult to then test in humans, especially in early stages of the process. So, and also the fact that taste is subjective. So even though human measurement is the best, still got that little issue of preference. So some people like gin and tonic, some people don't. So that doesn't mean just because they feel it's bitter doesn't mean they don't like it. So it's very different from person to person and similar to like broccoli or Brussels sprouts. So it's perception and it's personal. But this is where equipment can help us. So both the subjective element and the safety element this is where we can use equipment. So what I use is called the e-tongue and the e-tongue assigns bitterness scores to medicines. And from that information, uh, basically we think about ways to improve the taste of the drug. So how the e-tongue works, basically it measures how much of that bitter material in the medicine sticks on a plastic sensor that is supposed to be the human tongue. And it, uh, you know, it's a little mimic of it and it compares how that measurement is in a clear sample like saliva and that difference between the two samples represents the theoretical bitterness of a medicine so this is how we would go about um, giving that number that numerical value to taste so as well as taste i'm also interested in all aspects of acceptability of a medicine and general experience really so like holding the container if it's a pouch opening the pouch how easy is it to swallow it how does it feel on the on the tongue so the mouth feel not just the taste so the overall acceptability all these things can stop people from taking their medicines. And, you know, mouthfeel is not just that gritty feeling. It could be metallic taste or burning sensation, or even that chalky feel you have after like drinking green tea. So all these things we can improve in the pharmaceutical industry. And they may seem like first world problems, but in practice, they're really important, especially when it comes to children taking their medicines for the long term. And a classic example is HIV medicines, which taste very bad and people have to take them for life. So this is where it would really come in handy. So all these uh, issues from taste, mouthfeel, smell, color, packaging can really influence someone's overall acceptability level and willingness to continue to take a medicine, not just force. And in the long run, really can affect their health outcomes. And, you know, as we started with, if you won't take the medicine, it won't do its job. And thank you for listening. Incredible. Incredible. If only every medicine could be as delicious as the, the banana amoxicillin I used to get as a child. <laughs> That's which, controversial. Um, I, well, I didn't get a lot of sweets and it was the nicest thing that I ever got. So one time um, when I was young, I faked an ear infection in order to get, um, and the GP fell for it, and in order to get a prescription for banana medicine. Um, yeah. Don't do that, by the way. If there are any children watching, yeah. don't.
don't fake illnesses in order to uh, get specific types of medicine. Um, thank you, Hen. That was absolutely wonderful. Now, I'm going to bring back all of our speakers onto the screen so that we can see how everybody is. Uh, no, have I missed anybody? No, 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 no. Good, you're all lit. Um, I just wanted to show you, friends, uh, some of the nice things that um, people on the internet have been saying about you. They've been saying things like amazing talk. They've been saying things like very interesting talks. Um, and my favourite one, um, there's no form of praise that beats all caps with exclamation marks. Um, so it's just some specific praise to show over there. Now, um, wherever you are, let's give all of our speakers a final round of applause because they've been so absolutely wonderful for us today. You're allowed to bow a little bit, speakers, if you want to take the applause and now um, I'm going to remove everyone again and uh, I'm going to bring onto the screen uh, the IHE's wonderful communications boss Alice to tell us all about the next one of these because we're back again next week with a whole bunch of new incredible engineers. Alice yeah. when are we back? We are back at the same time so 12 o'clock uh, on Tuesday, the 17th of May, next Tuesday. Um, so if you enjoyed today's session and from the looks of the comments, you definitely did. Uh, please do join us again next week. We'll be back with uh, the incredible Steve and we will have uh, the second half of our Impact Fellows. Um, so it's not going to be the same talks. It's going to be um, loads of new interesting topics for you to enjoy, um, more incredible research, more robots, uh, more x-rays, more amazing machines. So please do come along. Absolutely wonderful. Now, a uh, quick technical hint for all of you, that will be on a different YouTube link. Um, so you need to go to where you got the YouTube link for this week's one. Next week's one will be on a separate YouTube link. This one will still be on this YouTube link so that you can watch it back whenever you want to. Um, it's been great. I feel like I've learned so much about my body and uh, all of the things that might be helping it in the next few years. I'm very excited. I'm going to pick these people's brains. If you have got more questions for any of them, ping a tweet to at health underscore eng. Eng there is short for engineering. And Alice will find somebody that can answer your question. But mostly, thank you all. Thank you all for coming to YouTube. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for, for listening. And um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.